Hello, and welcome to Notes from the Conservatory, a podcast from the Bob Cole Conservatory of Music at California State University, Long Beach. I'm your host, Richard Cooper. This podcast is a chronicle of conversations and interviews with our faculty, students, and guest artists. Today, we have a conversation with two faculty members who are also alumni of CSULB, Jay Mason and Sal Lozano. Sal plays in big bands led by Tom Kubis and Johnny Mandel. He is a founding member of Gail Goodwin's Big Fat Band. Sal has also recorded with Christina Aguilera, Lalo Schifrin, Maynard Ferguson, Natalie Cole, and many more. He's a member of the Academy Awards Orchestra and the Dancing with the Stars House Band. He has also performed on American Idol, The Tonight Show, Animaniacs, Pinky and the Brain, and numerous national commercials. Sal's motion picture credits include The Secret Life of Pets, Sing, Ice Age, High School Musical 3, Public Enemies, and happy feet. He also conducts clinics and master classes around the world and for the past 22 years has been a clinician for the Disney Performing Arts Organization. Jay Mason has played with Michael Feinstein, Johnny Mathis, Seth MacFarlane, Take Six, Jerry Seinfeld, Cirque du Soleil, and many others. He's also a member of the Big Fat Band and appears regularly with other Southern California big bands including Tom Kubis and Bob Mintzner. He's the principal saxophonist in the Long Beach Municipal Band and performs with the Pasadena Pops, Hollywood Bowl Orchestra, and Pacific Symphony. Jay was also in the Disneyland Band, where he eventually played every woodwind instrument in the ensemble. He has also played on the soundtracks for parades and rides at Disneyland. He has been in the orchestra for shows like Phantom of the Opera, Wicked, Book of Mormon, Young Frankenstein, and many more. His soundtrack credits include Toy Stories 2 and 3, Frozen, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, The Secret Life of Pets, and The World of Warcraft. And now, here's our conversation with Jay Mason and Sal Lozano. How long have we been doing this? Teaching? Uh, Fall of 2005. I had to think about it, too. So that's 12 years, right? I have no idea. Really, it's been that long? It's been that long. Yeah, so 2005 in the fall is when we both were Did they call you and ask you, you know, we're looking for a person who has a doctorate in jazz studies or classical sax performance? You know, they said Leo's leaving. Oh, no, they didn't ask me that. No. It's Uh funny. We've never talked about this. They called me up one day and they said, so Leo's leaving. You know, we're looking for a replacement. We want somebody who has a doctorate in jazz studies or a doctorate in saxophone performance Mm. who has 10 years of experience teaching in a jazz program at a major university in a major market and also has 10 to 15 years of experience playing in a major market. And they just rattled off LA, Nashville, New York, that sort of thing. And I laughed (laughs) into the microphone and I said, well, I can think of two guys that fit that description and you're not going to get them. You know, any of you guys? And we don't have doctorates. (laughs) You know, and then they called us and said, hey, do you want to take part of it? And I said, that sounded like fun. Uh, I went to school with a guy named Kurt Curtis, whose dad is Larry Curtis. And uh, Kurt and I drove down here one time, and we hung out at his dad's house. His dad lived over here in Los Alamitos. And his dad kind of told me a little bit about the program, and I kind of had an idea of maybe I wanted to go to a couple other schools and check out another couple schools and stuff. And I auditioned for the department, and um, I was given free private lessons. And I thought, what do you have to do to keep those? And I, well, all you have to do is just keep playing, just keep auditioning or having what's called a jury appearance every semester. So I just stayed here. Mm -hmm. Uh, At the time, we had a marching band, and it was a huge program. It was a a big social thing, and it was fun. And we played a lot of real good music in a marching band setting. It was unbelievable. This guy, Marvin Branson, wrote these charts that were just fantastic. We had three jazz bands, and I eventually, by the end of my freshman year, was playing in all three of them including two wind ensembles, and I was playing flute in a conducting class. So I was getting all my experience in all these different instruments in all these different settings, which was really great. Well, while I was in high school, uh, I grew up in Huntington Beach, which is just down the road here, and um, there was this band called The Rhythm Machine, (laughs) which we both know very well, and uh, they used to play at this place called Hungry Joe's down on PCH, and my saxophone teacher at the time Don Hawkins and I used to go hang out and listen to those and um, I met Tom Kubis at those things and he said you know you ought to look at Long Beach and I had been thinking about some other schools 
and I came up here and uh, took a look at the programs, similar kind of thing to him. We walked around the school a little bit, liked it, um, got in, did the audition, and um, I ended up in the marching band too. This is like you said, it's this gigantic program. We had an absolute blast with that. Like three hundred and fifty people. Yeah, and we have people that we're still very friendly with who we met through that program that have gone into all sorts of other walks of life as well as what we're doing. And um, I ended up playing in the marching band. I ended up playing in the symphonic band. I didn't do anything with my flute or my clarinet my first year here. I was aware of the jazz bands and all that kind of stuff, so I didn't audition for the jazz bands until my sophomore year. Then took off from there as far as the jazz program. The music department, by the way, was what is now the film and media mm-hmm. department, and it was real small. Caught a few people, but it was a small community, you know, physically speaking, get around anywhere in this little music department. Mm-hmm. Nothing like this Cole Conservatory of Music wasn't even thought of out here. It was a parking lot. Right. And um, the jazz program that we had with John Prince, people that were in there in my freshman year, sort of the beginning of the end of the major, major players that were there. This guy named John Patitucci, this bass player, was there. Dave Metzger was writing the music. Before that is when Kubis and Jim Cox and Chad Wackerman, who teaches here now, and all these amazing musicians came through here. And at the same time, there were some great students that were at other schools in Northridge and at SC. Gordon Good was at, was at Cal State North. It was just before uh, Jay and I got to Long Beach State. Bill Liston was here. Mm-hmm. But all those guys lived around. There was this little close network of people that were around here. And most of it came from schools like Cal State Long Beach and some of the junior colleges that were down, the Golden West College, Orange Coast College, Santa Ana College, provided a real big conglomerate of people that this town eventually drew from to make music yeah. and to teach. I felt very lucky to be here at the time that we were here yeah. because we used to do a thing here called a semester recital. Mm-hmm. Remember that? You know, we all kind of didn't want to go. Every Tuesday and Thursday you played at noon and you were supposed to play if you were a music major. You had to play a little recital. Patatucci's group with Carl Denson, those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Carl there's a Denson. great saxophone player. You know, these guys would get up there and we'd all show up and make sure we got a chance to hear them play. Kind of like it is now. I mean, there's a community of guys and gals that came up together. You know, that we're all still out there doing things together. Mm-hmm. I tell my students that a lot. It's like the people you're sitting here with today and you're working with today, be very careful to maintain those friendships because you just never know mm-hmm. where that's going to lead. Boy, you know, there's two people in that era, as far as educators were concerned, who really had an impact on me. It was John Prince and it was Leo Potts. Yeah. John Prince would sing stuff to us. You know, he'd die, die, do that. You know, and he'd make you try to play it exactly how he was singing it. And, and Leo just taught me how to play the saxophone. Mm-hmm. And me too. I remember him asking me, What do you want to play? You want to play jazz or you want to play classical music? And I said, well, I want to play jazz. He goes, I'm going to teach you how to play saxophone right. first. And I went, Oh. And I went to his house and we lived in Westminster and he had a real, real tape machine with a microphone that hung from the ceiling. And he goes, okay, play this little melody for me. I knew he was gonna record me. So I started playing it and then he stopped and he played it back for me and I was like, oh, this is awful. I remember just leaving there going, what am I gonna do? Am I supposed to be a music major for crying out loud? And he really set me straight with the air and the fingers and all that. He had an impact on all, very many of us. On all way. of us, yeah. yeah. And, and I, that's funny, I'm laughing because I did the same thing, I went to his house and took lessons. And I think that was the first time I'd ever heard myself back. And I had the exact same reaction. It was like, oh, wow. We had a lot of prominent saxophone players come from there too. Just a little after us, uh, Greg Vale, Jeff Kashua, Mark Vischer, they all they all have a knowledge of what Leo was trying to tell us. You know. Dave Sills. Dave Sills, that's right. Yeah, Yeah. Um, Turner, Mark Turner, Turner. Turner. that's right, yeah. Yeah. Are you hearing this? They all went here. <laughs> Besides us. The other interesting thing that happened with us that is available now, too, that I think is a really good thing is, I don't know if you did this, but I didn't get involved in the big bands as much because I was an ed major. So I had to kind of make up for lost time. So one of the things that I did was play in the concert band. So I oh, played yeah. flute and then clarinet in the concert band. You know, you can do that here now, too. I know mm-hmm. a lot of our students do that. Mm-hmm. And... Um, that was a huge help. And I mean, you know, you're sitting next to amazing flute and clarinet players too right, and right. getting free lessons. Right. Essentially, it was really helpful. But yeah, there was 
a definite network of guys and gals that came through here that was just remarkable. I left here in 83 and thought, well, uh, that's that, you know. And then 2005, I got this phone call, you know, hey, would you like to come and, you know, take this many students? And yeah, I would like to do that, you know. At the end of my time at Long Beach State, I tried to teach a high school jazz band, and it was really rough. I would get up and go to this high school in Anaheim at 7 in the morning, and it was really, just wasn't something I wanted to do. I started working as a player at Disneyland when I was a sophomore in college. Ended up getting a job there full time. After 1990, when I left the band, there was this educational program that Disneyland had. At the time, it was called Magic Music Days, where we would take these kids and we would lead them through a one and a half hour recording session, recording music to a Disney film. The music was written especially for them at their level using a click track and we still do it now, 27 years now. So that was the extent of education until 2005 and I can honestly remember coming here and not having any curriculum, not knowing what I was going to tell these kids other than what I was taught. I was kind of flying by the seat of my pants because with every student I had to stop and say, you're playing out of tune. And I don't care if you want to learn how to play like Charlie Parker or John Coltrane, you're playing out of tune. They thought, well, no, I want to play this jazz stuff. I want to play this, you know, really bebopper, and I want to play this, you know, Michael Brecker. And I said, I, I understand that, but you need to play with technique first. You need to play with a good sound first. You know? And so with the help of the Jazz Studies program with Jeff Jarvis and with John Barcelona, from the Woodwind Studies, they all gave us the support. They said, yes, you need to do all of that. It can't just be one or the other. It has to be everything. And um, I think Long Beach State right now, as far as saxophone education and jazz studies and overall saxophone playing, has a reputation now where if you want to come here and study, yeah, you're going to learn, but be prepared to work because the payoff is good. You're taking lessons from people who have extreme experience in the world of music in Los Angeles. Well, he was at Disneyland, and uh, my first gig that paid anything was there was a band here called the Sunshine Band, and our specialty was polkas, and not the normal polkas that everybody does. I mean, this guy handed me a book, and he said, here's about 100 polkas, and you gotta play these on tenor or clarinet, and our first gig's in a week, here you go. And he says, we do this for the first hour and a half or two at these German weddings and Polish weddings. Then we do rock and roll in Motown. And it paid really good. So that's the first thing that I did. And then I remember I ended up doing a parade band at the park. I was on a float. That's where the baritone thing comes from. <laughs> and um, guys like Sal, this goes back to the thing we're talking about networking and just you know the people you came up with through college. You know, hey, he's out here, he's available, call him to sub in the Disneyland band, call him to sub in the saxophone. There used to be a saxophone quintet there. I ended up in the Disneyland band for a little while too, and um, it was just a great experience. People have asked me all the time, you know, what was the best thing you got out of it? And I said, well, you know, it's July 4th, and it's hotter than blazes out there, and I have to go out and play the Stars and Stripes on the piccolo. Now it's Christmas Day and it's 45 and I got to go play Stars and Stripes on the piccolo. You really do learn how to play a lot and you get into a lot of different situations. And then from there, I left there and um, started freelancing again. We're both in this amazing big band called The Big Fat Band with Gordon Goodwin. Um, aside from that, movies, television, Broadway shows. We used to do a lot more jingles, but they're still out there, you know, advertisements and that sort of thing. I mean, I play oboe and English horn now. That's another thing I added to my list later on. One of the best things that happened was I got to do a couple of sessions with John Williams on, uh, I think it's The Amazing Adventures of Tintin. That movie starts off with a whole musical thing with animation, and they didn't like the version that they originally recorded, so they called up and, you know, it's on a Sunday morning, can you do it? And it's like, yeah, you know, we're in there. And uh, John Williams has three different versions. There's a little baritone saxophone duet between a uh, great player in town, Greg Huckins and I, back and forth on this thing, and we're recording. Another Long Beach State guy, Greg Huckins. Yeah, by the way. Yeah. And um, we finish a, a take, and this very recognizable gentleman is standing right off my shoulder because I'm on baritone, I'm on the end. And he says, man, pats me on the shoulder. This is going to be great. He says, hi, my name's Steve. 
I'm like, yeah, I know who you are, Steven Spielberg. Oh, <laughs> you know, I'm just looking at him oh, going like, so there. That that was a highlight for me. Yeah, get him over. The Disneyland band at the time, we were doing a lot of sit down sort of shows, playing for ceremonies and and acts and things, and so they were writing parts for us to play, and this one man named Ken Whitcomb, he took a liking to me, and he would write me these ridiculous piccolo and flute parts. And I have been studying flute. I studied flute at the time with Jim Walker. I took a couple lessons with Barcelona, but I studied with Jim Walker after that. And I was really focusing on my technique on the flute. And Ken was writing these parts, and they were really hard, and I was kind of playing them. And so after I left Disneyland, Bruce Healy, the music director there, had remembered that I was playing flute and piccolo, and he called me. It was like, I left Disneyland in November of 90, and like the next year, around March, he called me to play this recording session for one of the theme park parades or something. And it was like, wow, I can play this. And um, that kind of launched me into a little bit of recording, not much. And then my name got thrown into the hat to play at the Schubert Theater, which was in Century City. I did that initially in the, in 91 for about seven months and kind of just stayed in that loop. Slowly, slowly kind of got my name involved with that kind of thing. The Amundsen Theater, uh, the Orange County Performing Arts Center, um, the Pasadena Playhouse, things like that. And then the recording aspect started to pick up a little bit. And I began some relationships with people who would call me for things, either episodic television, a handful of motion pictures, and then quite a bit of live television. American Idol, America's Got Talent, the first 17 seasons of Dancing with the Stars, the Latin Grammys, the Grammys, the Emmys, the Oscars. All of those shows that I mentioned, were I was getting calls by one man. And so I was lucky enough, real lucky enough, to get on his list and um, still do quite a bit of that. Pit orchestras, yeah. The longest one I did was seven months at the Schubert. And now the average for me is between two and six, seven weeks. Yeah. I'm starting one next week that's going to go for seven weeks right. at the Amundsen Theater. Jay works down the Orange County Performing Arts Center. That goes like one week or two weeks, right? Well, you want to know how interlocked we end up is the show that he's playing next week. I'm playing right now. We call each other for things all the time, and we recommend each other or recommend people to each other all the time. Here I asked Jay and Sal to tell me a little bit about the Woodwind program at Cal State Long Beach. I think the support for the students in terms of the ensembles is pretty phenomenal here. They can play in the big bands if they want to be jazz majors. They can play in the concert bands if that's the thing that they want to do. They can play in the symphony. But they can also do the thing we were talking about earlier where you can be in one of the band that's not your main focus. Um, we have a concert band that meets here, and a lot of my students play flute and clarinet in that band and oboe too. But just the level of the ensembles, I mean, it's one thing to teach your students. It's another thing to teach them and then have them go out, and they're all pushing each other, and the leaders of those ensembles are pushing the level very, very high. I think that's one big reason to come here. As far as our program is concerned, we all have an integrated philosophy, you and I certainly do, you know, it's about the saxophone. You know, we want you to be able to do anything. I think that this university is pretty much at the forefront because it's about music. It's not about one style of music versus another one. It's about music in general. It'll give you an idea of how to teach it, how to play it. There's business classes, music business classes. There's a master class that Christine Gutner and I teach regarding the business as a vocalist and as an instrumentalist. Unlike other disciplines at the university, uh, you can't just get a job after four years. You have to do other things. And so you need to have that drive. Yeah. And I think right now, more than ever, we are providing that drive for these students. Right. I agree. I was very lucky. I had a couple of high school students before I ever got here who did really well. And uh, my goal for them when they declared, this is where I'm going, is I need to give you enough tools so that when you're done, you can make good decisions as a player and as a musician to keep growing and get better and make it out there because we know what that is. And I think the whole department here does that. It's a pretty amazing thing. And there's a long lineage too, certainly for saxophones. Here I asked Jay and Sal about their experience playing in the Big Fat Band. I'm an original member of the band. We played a show for the International Association of Jazz Educators at Disneyland, at the Disneyland Hotel. 
and it was an annual convention they had. And the Disney company decided to put together a big band to play Disney tunes in a swing sort of fashion. And we had some guest artists there, and uh, uh, Marie McGovern and Arturo Sandoval and um, Kevin Mahogany. Kevin Mahogany yeah. was there. And Gordon was the leader of the band. After that, he said, you know, I got an itching to maybe do an album. And we recorded the first album in 2000, I think. Then he didn't want to do anything. He didn't want to tour. He didn't want to, you know, just... They had a CD release party put on for the band. The band played at Cal State Northridge, Gordon's alma mater. And then, and then we, for some reason, we got asked to play at this thing called the Midwest Band Clinic. And it was in Chicago either the following year or the year after. And so this is the early 90s. And the Midwest Band Clinic is this four-day thing where all these band directors go and hear music and hear ensembles, and then they network, and they maybe buy the music that the ensemble's playing or something. So this group of directors, I just heard, like the Tokyo Wind Ensemble, playing playing Mahler for concert band. And then we were starting playing at 9.30, the big fat band, we're a bunch of knuckleheads up there, you know? And so we're going up there, we're having a great time, you know? And, and we play, and we had Eddie Daniels with us, and um, high note trumpet players, Wayne, and Bergeron, and Andy Martin, another Long Beach State guy, he's up there playing trombone, and Marienthal, and, and woodwinds with all these flutes and clarinets and stuff like that. And um, that night, we got four offers to travel. Right. And so most of the work we do is travel. But what's great about our band, we've been to Japan at nine times. What's great about our band is that we travel well. We've known each other for a long time. The old formula of big bands where it was made up of 20-something-year-old kids they room together and try to get along and they don't. And there's This band has always gelled. We've always had a good rapport together. We can hang out all the time. That's kind of the main part of our, of our oh, yeah. hey, let's go to Tokyo. Oh, good, we get to go to that one noodle place. That's right. right. Right when we get there, we need to go to that noodle place. And that was, you know, let alone play in this band that, that really sounds good. Well, We're going to start recording our eighth album in next month. Next month. I got involved in the band. Um, they did the concert here at the uh, Jazz Educators Convention, and I was playing in another band. So I stayed and listened to the concert because they're all friends of mine in the band. The band sounds phenomenal. And I'm like, man, that's really great. I hope they do this again sometime, and maybe I get to do it. Well, then that Northridge concert that you mentioned... Mm -hmm. Gordon Goodwin, we had worked back together at Disneyland, mm -hmm. you know, and he remembered me. He was like, I always remember you and all this kind of stuff. And then, like, Greg Huckins decided that after that first album that he wasn't going to do the band anymore. And Gordon called me up and says, would you like to do the band and play on baritone? I'm like, yeah, I'll play. And uh, here we are. It's a lot of great people getting together and playing great music. A lot of fun. Somebody asked me, it's like, when did you know that it was a thing? And you mentioned the Midwest Clinic. We did a gig in a town called Powell, Wyoming at the Powell Community College and Gordon goes, yeah, we're getting on these flights. So we leave LA and we fly to Salt Lake City and we get on a turboprop, a little small airplane you know, and we land in Cody, Wyoming which is the gateway to Yellowstone Park get on a bus drive, what, about an hour up yeah. to this little community college, beautiful theater, pretty good size and we're like, we're in the middle of nowhere. In the middle of nowhere. So we do our sound check and we're like, this is fun and all this stuff. And they had food for us and people were really nice. And we used to do this thing where the rhythm section would go out front and they would play. They'd start a tune and then Gordon would introduce each guy in the band. Because I'm the furthest over on the left playing baritone, I was always the first guy up. So Gordon's up there and he goes, you know, ladies and gentlemen. And the rhythm section starts and this place went yeah. nuts. I mean, there was like 3,000 people or so yeah. in this theater. And I come walking across the stage and I'm looking up going, wow. Played the concert, and at the end, we did some autographs. This kid walked up to me, and he said, would you sign this baritone sax strap that I have? And I'm like, of course. I said, where are you from? He says, oh, we drove over here from uh, North Dakota to see you guys. Yeah, the people <laughs> driving from Denver to come see us at that concert. Yeah. And they told us at the end of the night, they said, you know, we had enough tickets sold that we could have had you guys another night. That's when it really hit me. I remember sitting on the plane coming home the next day just going... This is a thing. Oh, yeah, it's a big thing. We have kids sometimes that buy the play-along books, and they'll follow along, or we'll, or we'll be playing, and we'll stand up to play some sort of a sax feature or something like that, where all five of us stand up, and you can see the kids singing along to our parts, because they know them that well. 
You've been listening to Notes from the Conservatory from the Bob Cole Conservatory of Music at California State University, Long Beach. Thanks for listening.